Across North America, the 60s were a time of significant cultural and political upheaval. In Canada, a new flag was unveiled. The country celebrated its centennial, and the World's Fair was held in Quebec, known as Expo 67. A successful fair, this event introduced Montreal to the world. Though the country is experiencing post-war prosperity, it was still a tumultuous time as tensions were high over economic issues and calls for Quebec sovereignty. It was this year of growth and change that, on May 20th, in Falcon Lake, that a man would encounter a craft whose intentions and origins are, to this day, unknown. Falcon Lake is a 3,700-acre recreational lake located in Manitoba, Canada. Today, visitors can enjoy self-guided trails through the rocky forest, fish for rainbow trout, brown trout, or walleye, visit a family-owned ranch for horseback riding adventures, and swim in the lake's cool waters. Back in 1967, it was here that Stefan Mekalak, a budding geologist and industrial mechanic, would go on to prospect for minerals and semi-precious gemstones on the weekends. During the weekend of May 20th, Mikalak was doing just that. At around 5.30 a.m., he made his way out to a rocky area where he had discovered a quartz vein. It was a bright and sunny day without many clouds in the sky. He brought with him a hammer, map, compass, pencil and paper, and some food for his journey out to his prospecting zone. Once he made his way to the selected area, he settled in and began to chip away at the vein. His focus was only broken when a group of nearby geese began to screech, clearly alarmed by something nearby. It was as Mikalak turned that he saw them, two cigar-shaped objects with bumps on the tops coming down from above. According to the witness, they had a scarlet-hued glow to them. One of the objects came all the way down from the sky, landing on a nearby rock. The other object stopped about 15 feet off the ground. It hovered there for a few moments before slowly rising back up into the sky. With the second object gone, Mikalak turned his attention to the craft that landed about 160 feet from him. The craft was no longer just scarlet. It was turning colors ranging from light gray to red gray to red. He stared at the craft and was, in his words, ready to record in my mind everything that happened. Getting out his notebook, he sketched it for the next 30 minutes. Mikalak's first thought was not that he was witnessing an alien spaceship. Instead, a down-to-earth mechanic, he assumed it was a test craft from Canada or the U.S. Curious to see if anyone was inside, he made his way over to the object and called out. There was no response, but he could hear voices coming from inside the object. Speaking several different languages, including Polish, German, and Russian, Mikolak called out again. There was no answer from the craft, only a whirling sound coming from the vehicle. Observing the craft more closely through his welding goggles, he noticed that there were no signs of welding or joints in the entire body's new made of a stainless steel type of metal. A curious man, he reached out to touch the craft, which immediately burned his glove. The craft began to turn revealing a panel of small holes on one side, like a vent. Suddenly, a hot blast of air shot out, hitting him in the chest and stomach and setting his hat and shirt on fire. Disoriented, he ran back, vomiting into the woods. As he regained his composure, he watched the craft soar off into the sky. He began to feel more nauseous and his head began to hurt. He knew that something was wrong and that he needed to get help, but he still wanted to investigate the landing site. He made his way over to the rock where the craft had been and saw that the area was completely clear. All the leaves, sticks, and other debris that had been on the ground had all been blown away into piles. In an interview for Library and Archives Canada, Mikalak's son, Stan Mikalak, said that his father made his way back to the road where he encountered a Royal Canadian Mounted Officer, who was skeptical of the story. Once he made it back to his motel, he collected his items and caught a Greyhound bus back to Winnipeg, where he was treated at Misericordia Hospital. He was suffering from first-degree burns that formed a dotted pattern on his chest and abdomen, the same pattern of the craft's vent. He did not tell the doctors the exact cause of his injuries, explaining instead that he had just been burned. But his silence did not last long. Mikalak was worried. What if that craft was still out there? What if it hurt someone else? In an effort to protect the public, Mikalak reached out to the Winnipeg Tribune, where his story was published as, I was burned by a UFO. After that first article, interest exploded. Before long, Mikalak's story was national and international news. Reporters weren't the only ones to visit Mikalak. Soon after the encounter, Mikalak was visited by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Royal Canadian Air Force. The constant visitors are what prompted Stan, Mikalak's son, to name his book about his father, When They Arrived, alluding to the many people who wanted to speak to Mikalak about his encounter. 
Of the meetings, Stan said, it started with, naturally, the RCMP, who showed up first. Then they involved the Royal Canadian Air Force, they showed up next. Then Atomic Energy Canada got involved. Then there was a series of doctors, none of whom could do much for dad. Then there was the interesting organization that came out of the United States called APRO, which stands for Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. On May 23rd, two officers came to Mikulak's home for his statement. A member of APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, a civilian group that investigates UFO sightings, was also at the house speaking with Mikulak. The authorities wanted him to take them out to the site so they could investigate, but he was reportedly too ill to make the trip. Instead, Mikulak drew a map of the area and told the authorities how to get there. Once the group found the site, it was just as Mikulak had described. In the Library and Archives Canada podcast, author Palmyro Campana says, There was a small, very tiny patch of soil in the landing zone that demonstrated a radium-like type of radiation, which they likened to the luminous paint that used to be used back in the day for letting your watch glow at night and that kind of thing. Nothing major. According to researcher Chris Rutowski in the same podcast, Mr. Mikulak returned to the site. He and an associate had found some silver pieces that were in cracks in the rock over which the UFO was said to have hovered. These pieces were retrieved, and when they were given to the investigators, they too were found to be radioactive. In fact, the analyses have that they performed on them found that the pieces were fairly pure silver that had been coated with some sticky substance, and that some radioactive uranium ore had been stuck onto them, perhaps from being within the cracks in the rock. They're very, very unusual, and they're radioactive to this day. What caused this contamination remains unknown, and no one has been able to prove or disprove this encounter. What was the craft that Mikulak saw? One theory suggested by an RCAF squadron leader was that Stefan Mikulak was hallucinating the encounter. But what of the burn marks and the illness? Another theory was that it was some sort of new aircraft created by the U.S. or Canadian militaries. That it was some sort of man-made craft was the belief held by Mikulak himself. Others, such as the APRO, believed that it was an alien spaceship. Exactly what the encounter was may never be known, but it still remains one of the most researched and documented unexplained craft sightings of all time. Thank you for listening to tonight's story. Tune back in next week as we dive into the world of cryptids, extraterrestrials, and the great unknown. Good night.